Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. PlenAirMagazine.com And by Masterpiece Canvas, makers of fine art canvases. We supply the canvas, you supply the vision. And by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com Twenty thousand years ago, nearly 50% of North America was covered by glaciers that extended from the North Pole, down through Canada, and over what is now known as the 48 contiguous United States. As the glaciers moved, their weight and density began sculpting the physical characteristics of the continent, concealing their work under thousands of feet of ice and snow. As the cycle of natural global warming began melting these massive sheets of ice, their brilliant impact was slowly exposed leaving behind some of the most beautiful landscapes on the planet. Standing as a beacon above the Pacific Northwest is a volcano that has become one of America's last resting places for the remnants of these inspired glacial forces. My name is Stefan Bauman and welcome to the Grand View. Today we're going to explore America's fifth national park. Mount Rainier is not only known for its spectacular beauty, but for its geologic and glacial history. It's a beautiful and fascinating place to explore for an artist also. So come along with me as we explore America's fifth national park, Mount Rainier. Well, it's one of the oldest national parks in the country. Um, Mount Rainier was established as a national park in 1899, so it was the fifth national park. Um, and some of the early proponents of establishing the park were actually people who climbed Mount Rainier, some of the very first people who climbed here, um, including one of my favorite characters, who is a woman named Faye Fuller, the first woman who climbed Mount Rainier in 1890. And her father was a newspaper publisher, and she wrote um, a weekly column about her experiences climbing and those of her friends. And she, uh, she and other climbers did a lot to develop interest in the mountain and start the movement to create it as a national park. Mount Rainier is, is not only an icon for the park, but it's really an icon for the state of Washington and for the whole region. Um, I think when people think of the Northwest, they think of Mount Rainier. Um, so lots of people who are coming up here are just coming to get a closer look at this colossal mountain, this mountain that has kind of a, a, a fiery heart and a mantle of ice and snow. Um, and then there are other things that draw people to the wildflower meadows here at Paradise are definitely something that people come specifically to see. And down lower on the slopes of the mountain, the old growth forest, because the Northwest has lost a lot of its remaining old growth. And so people will come up here to see um, 
the forest lands down low and the subalpine meadows up high to have a look at the glaciers. You know, there's 25 glaciers that radiate off of the mountain. And uh, just in general to enjoy the beautiful mountain scenery. Well, I think Mount Rainier is one of the best kept secrets in the national park system. Um, and, and Mount Rainier still has more of a, a hometown quiet feel to it. Um, it's a park that's really loved and supported by the people in this region. You know, when people in the Northwest talk about the mountain, is the mountain out today? Have you seen the mountain? There's only one mountain that we're talking about, and that is Mount Rainier. Um, so it, it's a beautiful place that is loved by millions of people who live in the region, and those people have really worked to protect it. And, um, you know, I would encourage anyone who hasn't been here, who has been to maybe some of the higher profile national parks, but not Mount Rainier, to come and see it because it is such a gem. Um, I can't imagine a more, more beautiful mountain than Mount Rainier with this combination of glaciers and an active volcano and the subalpine meadows, the old growth forest, the waterfalls. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Rainier is a big volcano, but it's in part a big volcano because it's growing on high mountains. And those mountains have elevations of a, up to about 7,000 feet in the area. And going up the, going up the valleys approaching Mount Rainier, one finds small exposures of those older uh, basement rocks of the, of the Cascades up again to elevations of about 7,000 feet. Those are heavily glaciated. They've been carved into by Ice Age glaciers, so they produce really craggy sorts of ridges and peaks. But surrounding them are cirque basins. These are basins where the glaciers were once nestled. And there are things like moraine dams and, and little fields of moraines which have sedimented in to produce meadows. The early workers who had, who had studied Mount Rainier in the 1950s didn't have the benefit of the precise age measurements that we have now. So they looked at Mount Rainier and one of the things that they noticed was that the majority of the lava flows actually sit on the tops of ridges. And this is a funny thing because lava is a, it's a fluid. It's like water so you expect it to flow down into the, into the river valleys and fill them up. Uh, so we started looking carefully at the sides of the lava flows, and what we started seeing were little areas where there, was, there were glassy surfaces preserved on the near vertical sides of the lavas. And glass forms when lava cools very fast. And in that the glass was on the vertical side of the lava flow, tells us that that vertical side of the lava flow was the original side of the lava flow. Okay, so then you, these glassy sides are facing the, the deep canyons, which are now empty. But if you think about it, most of the growth of Mount Rainier took place during the Ice Ages, when, when the valleys would have been filled with hundreds to perhaps as much as a thousand feet of ice. What all of this information tells us is that the lavas, when they erupted during the Ice Ages, would seek the path of least resistance. They would go farthest where they could go farthest. So a lava might erupt high in the volcano and it starts to move down the side of the volcano and eventually it runs into a glacier. Well, it will melt into that glacier to some extent, but in so doing it chills the side of the lava flow and makes a hard wall. So the lava then has difficulty advancing in that direction. So it will advance again where there is no ice. This mountain would meant a lot to, uh, to the native people in the Squally that they, uh, they called it Takabats. Uh, uh, that means uh, nourishing breast. And then uh, you go to Sweat Lodge, 
And they say this mountain, it represents the baby in the woman's womb. This mountain was a spiritual mountain to them. And it's a, and uh, Mother Earth was their mother. You see, Mother Earth owns us, we don't own Mother Earth. Our last chief, Lushai, and his brothers, they chased him clean down into Montana. By Mon Montana, he come up over here and went into Canada. They couldn't catch him. And, and when he did surrender, they murdered him. Him and his brother. One of my uh, nieces from, she's teaching these younger generation the uh, native songs and the native language. She's bringing it all back. My parents, my grandmother, every, every place we went, we'd go up in the mountains somewhere. We'd trade. We always had canned fish, canned berries, huckleberries. Most Indians canned the huckleberries and they traded them. My grandfather used to take us to all these old medicine men and they'd sit there and have little openings. And they'd be along the beach or the river and they'd build a little fire. All the spiritual engines, they'd get together in one fire and trade. We used to call them coyote stories. The more coyote stories they got, the longer they stayed there. And we little kids, we'd have to sit around a little area like this here, and some whale stories, fish stories, elk stories. Some of the engines used to praise the mountain. They'd be up here maybe three, they'd stay here three days, they'd fast, and they'd all the Indians. That's where you meet a lot of strong Indians, mm -hmm. spiritual. Mount Rainier has proven to be an amazing place to go visit. I've come here off and on over the years many, many times, but this time I've gone to all four corners in search of the perfect place. This place has it all for a painter. We have a beautiful foreground, beautiful trees, and Mount Rainier, stunning. In this light, we're sure to have a beautiful painting. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna take a smaller brush this time. I wanna make a more complicated sketch than I usually do. Now, we're going to put in all of these little details and these little nuances in our sketch. And I'm gonna very quickly sketch that in. Now notice I haven't come up with a hard line. And I do this on purpose because I wanna have some flexibility. If I put in a, a line with a pencil or a very strong painting line, I'm gonna feel like I'm stuck with that line throughout my painting. Also, by taking a, a paper towel and putting it into a little bit of turpentine, it helps you actually form another dimension to your sketch. You can wipe off areas and give the illusion of these glaciers. You can also add a lot of turpentine to your brush and wipe off that way also. You can see it actually starts giving you some half tones. I want to lay in the base for my trees in here. And notice how dark. I enjoy doing the sketch as much as I enjoy the painting itself. Now on the right, we have some large trees. And I'm going to bring these right up. They're going to actually tower over the mountain itself. This will actually give us a scale of how big we are in relationship to the mountain. I'm gonna take a little more turpentine and I'm wetting the whole foreground. One of the great things about painting outdoors is while you're sitting still for a while, nature comes out and visits you. I enjoy working outdoors because if you're still for a long time, 
all of a sudden birds and deer and bear and animals that run away because they see people in the forest come back out and they realize you're not really a threat. There's almost a fine line between painting and sketching. I think we've slowly crossed over that. I'm putting in more and more detail and I'm getting the mountain to be a little bit more accurate. Now I'm adding a little bit more highlight and I'm going to highlight only half of my glacier. This half will remain in shadow and that will help make this area of the mountain stick up. This is what's going to give my painting form and dimension. Or not just the highlights and shadows, but where they fall. And when you're outdoors, you can see this a lot better than when you're working with photography. And now with that done, it's time for us to put in our sky. I'm going to take a larger brush, I'm going to clean it, and I'm going to mix white and blue and a little bit of this gray color. I don't want to have a blue-blue sky, I want a kind of a cool yet grayish sky. Now this is going to change the entire appearance of the painting. And work it right up to the edge of the mountain. Now in this area here, I want to be sure to, to get a darker shadow. And what I'm going to do is add more white to my sky back here. Now I want to get this color really light, but yet blue. Now as this color goes up towards the left hand side of my canvas, I'm going to be adding more blue to it. And when I'm adding more blue to my color here, I'm also adding a little more gray. I'm going to go a little bit into my trees. I'll put them in a little bit later. And as I go to the top right hand side, I'm going to add more of that dark blue color. Now as we work towards the right side of our canvas, the sun's coming from that area and we want to warm up the sky a little bit. So I'm going to add a little bit more yellow to my bluish color. Now I'm taking this warm color and I'm mixing it into my blues. As the atmosphere gets closer to the sun, it warms up. Now with our sky done, we're ready to start working on the next layer of mountains. This layer is going to be a silhouette layer. It's a little darker. It's going to have a lot of blues in it. And we're going to mix up our gray color, and it's a greenish color. So we're going to mix up blue and yellow together. We're going to add that to our gray, and then we'll start painting this in as a solid shape. The great thing about painting areas that are dark is that there's not a lot of detail in them, so you can paint them very quickly. The main thing we're going to concentrate on is the ridge itself. On the ridge there are these wonderful pine trees that poke their heads up, and we're going to very quickly put those in. And now with our background trees done, we're ready to start working on the next layer of trees. These trees are a little further back than the foreground trees, but yet they're in front of the background trees that we just finished. And I want to give the illusion right in this place that there's a little brighter light. So I'm going to introduce more white into this color. And I'm going to bring the brush stroke up and I'm going to create the same type of tree that we did in the distance. And then as this ridge goes up, we want to darken it because it's up against a light background. And that's going to set the entire mountain way in the distance. And we want to bring these details up the same way as we did on the other mountain. Now notice that this color is darker in value than the, the trees in the background. And I'm just flicking the brush up. Now these are nice tall trees. So with large brush strokes, place them in. I'm going to introduce even more blue to it. And I want to paint the trees on the right hand side as a mass also. Now these trees are going to be in front of the painting. So they absolutely have to be the darkest. So there's absolutely no white in these colors. Okay, now I want to work on some of these washes coming down to my river. I want to switch to a smaller brush 
And with my gray color, I don't want these to be in strong sunlight. I'm trying to remember what it was like when I first came out here. And this is such a beautiful color. I'm gonna put this in as my mask color for my shadows in the riverbed. It would be relatively impossible to paint every one of these boulders individually. So what you need to do is develop kind of a rhythm and a technique to kind of create the illusion of what all of these boulders look like. I want to curl my stroke and I'm creating the round feeling of riverbed rocks. Now my base color is the shadow of these boulders. So you can see just with a flick of the brush how all of a sudden these boulders look round. Now with a brighter color, let's start getting some of the highlights in. Look at how much brighter this color is. Same stroke. And while we have this color, let's go ahead and highlight a little bit of these washes. And now with the detail done in our washes, we're ready to start putting the highlights into our trees. We're gonna to switch to our small fan brush and we're going to mix yellow and blue together and a lot of white. And we wanna create absolutely the brightest light green we can possibly make. It's just gonna make the trees pop out. Now to the right of this highlight, we want to work a little bit into our trees in the foreground. It's a little reverse painting. And you can see how my tree branches are starting to form themselves. Can you see how this becomes a central focal point? Right in the middle area of my painting. The viewer is going to follow this, this stream right up to the area of light. A lot of times, artists don't like to use fan brushes because they tend to have a certain geometrical look to them. They kind of all look the same. And that comes from using the whole front of the fan brush. What we're doing is using just the corner. And I'm just lightly stroking and bringing in shadows into these trees. I'm switching to a smaller brush and I'm going to get in some of the trunks. The trunks in the areas of light are gonna be darker and the trunks in the areas of shadow are gonna be a little lighter. And now with the detail finished on our distant trees, we're ready to start working on our foreground trees. I'm gonna to switch to a smaller detail brush and I'm gonna mix my dark gray and start putting in the trunks. Nice, steady strokes all the way up. Again, this is what is gonna establish scale. Now with that done, we're ready to start working on the branches. We're gonna switch back to our fan brush, load it up with the darkest of dark colors as we possibly can. These trees are gonna silhouette onto the background. This will definitely set this massive mountain way in the distance. I wanna leave this a little looser because I wanna get some branches in my trees. And I'm gonna do that with a little smaller brush, a few little dead branches. Right now there's wonderful light coming through and hitting some trees in this mass and I wanna highlight them. I think that it will add real beautiful effect to my dark in the right hand side. And now with the highlights in this area, we want to put in some of the branches. Hide some of those trunks with a little extra foliage. Make a few of them a little lighter and a few of them silhouetted against the light. Now with all the detail done in the foreground of our painting, we're ready to sign the painting and conclude this wonderful day at Mount Rainier. Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at the Grandview by calling 1-800-511-1337.
Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject. Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. Plein Air Magazine.com